So, hello again. I don't have a neat little intro like last time. I'm just not creative enough. But since I completely disrespected Crazy Alex with forgetting to slap him at the last one, he'll be chilling here for the rest of the video, rotating slowly, going about his day. With that out of the way, today we take a look, even if it's just very brief, into value painting. The step that comes after you sketched out your drawing and you're comfortable suggesting the 3D forms with well, value. A little disclaimer. When I talk about value here, I most likely talk about the kind of value that you can paint. You know, light and dark and all that. Not the kind of value you get when buying an NFT. Which is none, by the way, but that's another topic. You got your sketch ready, and I'm sure the time lapse in the background will have caught up. So the sketching phase is over right about now. Very well. When starting out with painting in the value of your illustration, a good way to do it is in complete black and white. It's just easier to see the errors we make along the way and sort them out. We don't have to think about the colors and how they behave on different materials and whatnot all. There are three major rules you have to keep in mind when adding value to your drawing. The first one is to never use complete white and complete black. When adding the value, I usually go from 95% to 5% gray, which is a good rule of thumb to keep your values believable. Of course, there are exceptions, for example, when drawing a cartoonish art style or comic book art. The line art that is visible in the final illustration is most likely completely black, and for comics, their shadows are often complete black as well. Pure white is something you'll most likely only use when there is a very bright light source directed at the viewer. Something like a floodlight directed at the camera or so. Otherwise, you'll tone it down a bit. Even in reflections of the sun, for example in the water, you'll tone down the brightness a little. Since a small part of the light is always lost when reflecting. That counts for glass and a super tiny amount for mirrors as well. Now there are sometimes cases where you will be adding a multiply layer to indicate shadows midway through the value painting which most likely results in having some complete blacks in your painting. But do not fear, you can just get rid of them. It's not a big deal at all. When using Photoshop or Procreate, I have no idea about paint tool, Sai or other drawing software, you will have a tool or an adjustment layer that is called curves. With that, you can tweak your darkest darks to be a fraction more light and push your values into a believable range again. To see how your values are at the moment, at least in Photoshop that is, you can open an adjustment layer or just click on the adjustment curves. The white or gray, depending on what color scheme you're rocking, lines that come out of the bottom here are indicating how much of this exact value is on your canvas. And if you didn't guess it by now, you can check if you've got pure blacks and pure whites by looking if there are any of these lines in the complete far right or complete far left end of the scale. Now let's go to the second rule of value painting. Do not paint on a white background, as in pure white and also not pure black. This one might sound a little like some shaman ritual, but it's just easier to see the values when you have a somewhat neutral background. So when drawing a character only, dim the background a little of your canvas. And when you use the entire canvas, start by putting some darker value in the background so you can focus better on how your foreground and your vocal points read. It's a fairly small and simple thing to be doing but it can help you out a lot and give your drawings that extra kind of nice look. The third rule of value painting is to be consistent with your values. This means that you determine a light source. For example, your light source is the sun, which is pretty damn bright in my opinion. So your lit areas are also going to be pretty damn bright because they reflect that intense light from the sun. Knowing that, I would say that non-reflective or not super reflective surfaces like metal or glass or even mirrors should be like around a 20% gray, sometimes even more. And your shadows will most likely be the darkest at the terminator, since they are going to catch bounce light from all the various lit surfaces around them. With these rules in mind, you consistently draw the lit areas with similar materials in the same value. And the same goes for shadow areas. It might sound like that's totally obvious to do, but a lot of artists work struggles to look as good as it could because some of the shadows are just darker than other areas which doesn't make any kind of sense. Not to say that ambient occlusion can be neglected, because it cannot, but it is something you do on a completely different layer in order to not fuck up the material values. 
Now for the end of this lesson, I'd like to talk about the process of adding light and dark. Some say to use an airbrush and others say to use a hard brush and blend and blend and blend until your arm falls off. The truth is, whatever floats your boat. I think it's good to try all the techniques, since you never know if you like it if you don't try it. And I personally switch it up as I go, whatever I am in the mood for. And for some specific materials, I think it's just easier to use one over the other. For example, shading matte sloped shapes, like cloth, is easier with a soft brush. And shading very reflective material, like a reflective dress made of sequins, is easier to do with a hard brush. Everyone got their own preferences, you just gotta find them out yourself. Unluckily, nobody can tell you this is the way to go and it's objectively the better solution all the time. With that being said, I wish you all the best. Happy drawing and until next time.